We're back. Welcome to the Love of the Star podcast. I am Bobby Bell, Dallas Scout was insider for 105 through the Fan of Dallas, joined as always by former Super Bowl winning NFL scout Brian Broadus. He is now the co host of the G Bag Nation, 2 to 7 p.m. Central, Monday through Friday on 105 through the Fan of Dallas. He's also the pre and post game co host on the Dallas Cowboys Radio Network, and he is a former co worker of one Mike Zimmer, the new defensive coordinator of the Dallas Cowboys. Brian, first off, before we jump into Mike Zimmer talk and and some Super Bowl talk and everything else, uh, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Bobby. How about yourself? I am doing great. Loving life and excited that the Cowboys, in my belief, made the right hire in Mike Zimmer. I think every name that was out there, if you ask me who is the perfect hire for what this defense needs in terms of what they need in terms of attitude, what they need in terms of scheme, what they need in terms of fostering talent and everything else, I thought Mike Zimmer was far and away the only candidate that made sense if you check all those boxes. I'm particularly really excited about what this means for Parsons and some of the A-gap pressures that Mike Zimmer is really fond of bringing, and I think that that's going to really benefit Parsons. Um, Some of the stuff that he's, you know, the history he has with, you know, helping to foster as a coordinator and as a defensive, you know, somebody overseeing the defense, some of the history he has in helping to foster the growth of pass rushers, not just here in Dallas, like Greg Ellis, um, who elevated his game here, and you know uh, Demarcus Ware, but also in Minnesota, the way he took a guy like Daniel Hunter, who people said is he all just you know what 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 is this guy? Is he somebody who's just all potential and is he ever going to reach it? And then he did, and then the way he leveled up Everson Griffin and helped you know really kind of keep a handle on Everson Griffin in a way that this Cowboys team couldn't for you know even three months. Um, so that's a lot. That's a mouthful there, Brian. But I am very, very excited about this Mike Zimmer hire, and I, I get the sense that you're a fan of this hire as well. Yeah, I absolutely love it, Bobby. I'm, I'm a. Excuse me, my voice is shot right now. It seems like, but in, uh, yeah, I, I feel like though that when you look at the Mike Zimmer hire, you mentioned all the the possible candidates. You know, it, it makes you kind of wonder. You know, did they lose a guy? You know, with Aiden Derdy. You know, that, that those are the things that you kind of, you know, um, if great there's coach. anything, what's that? I said great coach. Adam Dirty is a great coach. And uh, yeah, I mean, he he's a great coach. And you wonder, did you let a young guy get away? You know, could this be the next young guy? And, you know, but I don't think Mike McCarthy has a lot of, uh, I don't think he has a lot of time here, <laughs> you know, and I don't know if he can necessarily deal you know, with a first-year defensive coordinator. We saw what happened in Philadelphia with their situation. Two new coordinators, both of them fired, you know. And yep. so if you're in a situation where you're, you're you're trying to save your job or trying to move on and, you know, maybe elevate, um, you know, hiring a first-time coordinator could be a little bit of a problem. Now, if Mike McCarthy had two, three years left on a deal, maybe that's a whole different story. Uh, he'll be the one that we'll always kind of keep an eye on because he's the one guy that the more you studied him and the more you were around him, the more you were impressed by him. And so, but, uh, you know, with the candidates that were out there, I just, because I personally know Mike Zimmer. I mean, Mike mm-hmm. Zimmer and I go way, way back. Um, you, yeah, you back guys have worked in the trenches. What's yeah, that? You guys, have worked in, you guys have worked in the trenches together. Yeah, we were we were together, and you know, and, Mike was, I always had a lot of respect for Mike. I mean, I, I, his, his work ethic, his determination, his ability to teach were all very, very positive things for me. You know, and I, I saw him, I saw Bill Parcells challenge him. And, you know, you're, you know, you're thinking like, God, you're getting challenged by Bill Parcells. You better not fail. Mike didn't fail. You know, Mike, you know, he told Mike, he's like, hey, you're going to coach this 4-3 defense one more year. And then... You're going to have to coach this 3-4. We'll figure it out. We'll get some personnel in here. We'll, we'll, we'll adjust it. And Mike did both. And Mike did it both at a high level. And I was always super impressed by the challenges and the way he met the challenges. I was impressed with him, what he did in Minnesota um, as a head coach. And you're absolutely right. He can be very tough. He can be very demanding. But he's attention to detail. He's all about football. That's that's the great thing about about. Mike Zimmer is that he, when he gets in here, he is going to make everybody on that defense accountable. And that's no slam at, at uh, you know, at, at Dan Quinn. But, you know, there were some things when this team struggled in games, 
their defense struggled too. You know, and it, and it struggled with communication. It struggled with, uh, you know, with uh, the ability to, you know, the giving up the big plays, sometime with the scheme. You know, I mean, Dan did a fine job. 12 wins, fine job. But I just feel like there's, there's so much more that you could potentially get out of that defense. You know, get out of with Micah Parsons. You know, I think you, you mentioned all the guys that, that Mike's coached. And he has an understanding of how he wants to play scheme, how he wants to use guys. I think that's a real positive thing for the Cowboys going forward. I, I think, you know, that we're going to look back probably on this hire, and this this might be one of those hires that saves Mike McCarthy's job. This yeah. might be the one that saves his job, you know. And we'll see what, you know, Zim and talking to him, um, he's going to come in, he's going to look at the staff, He's going to kind of figure out what they got. They're going to try and figure out what they need. And then they'll go to work of, you know, trying to rebuild. I shouldn't say rebuild. I should say uh, make Renovate. additions on this defense at certain groups of personnel, the certain positions that absolutely need attention. And yeah. Mike and, the, and Will McClay will, will get after that uh, the first day they're all together. Yeah, I, I think that there's – a lot to unpack here in terms of differences between Zimmer and Quinn and some of the things that, uh, you know, Zimmer can bring to the table. And I, and like you said, I think Dan Quinn did a fantastic job here. I think Dan Quinn absolutely earned his opportunity to get another head coaching gig with what he did with this defense in three years that we've been begging other coaches to do with this defense for a decade and they hadn't been able to do. And, and so I, I think that Dan Quinn gets a ton of credit. I, I'm going to miss Having him around the building, I'm going to miss the way that he operates. I think he's a great coach. I think there are people that are going to miss him. I do think that this team, this defense, had ha, has evolved past the arm around the shoulder. Like, yeah. hey, buddy, what's what's going on? They they need somebody who's going to lay down the law a little bit. And if there's one thing that Mike Zimmer sort of has a reputation for, I know Darren Woodson told you guys this last week at Radio Row. You guys on G-Bag Nation got to talk to him. For 105 through the fan. If there's one thing that Mike Zimmer's probably not going to do very much, it's he's not going to coddle people. He's not going to no. coddle players or be your buddy. He's no. he's going to lay down the law. And you and I know Darren Woodson told y'all they became really good friends after years of working together and respect and trust that was built after his playing days. But when he's in it, he's not he he's not your buddy. He's he's there to to be your coach. No, I think you're. You totally nailed it, though, Bobby. That's that's the thing, and and I think players like you know the Darren Woodsons, um, you know, those are the guys that that lived it every single day. You know, those are the guys that you know Zim Zim. You know, he was very fortunate. You know, coming through college and then getting an opportunity, you know, to work on those Super Bowl staffs with some really good defensive coaches. He learned along the way. He developed. You know, he be you know he he coached Deion Sanders. He, he's coached some really high level, you know, players, all pro players. You know, and he um, he's not going to be your friend all the time. I mean, yeah, uh, that's just not his. That's not his mo. He is not a touchy feely feely huggy kind of a guy. You know, he really isn't. Yeah, I almost butchered all the words there, but that's you know <laughs> what I mean. He, that's just yeah. not his way of operating. I mean, if you get a hello out of Zim, you're doing pretty good, you know? You know, if you're you have an interaction with Zim, you're probably doing pretty good because he's just not a he's not the the type of guy that's just going to chit-chat with you. You know, he's it's about football. It's about playing sound defense. It's about doing your jobs. And it's about winning games. That's what Mike Zimmer does. So, I I like I say th- there's 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 some hires and some interviews that they made that I didn't feel that way. But yeah. now, you know, seeing Mike, seeing how he's grown as a coach, um, I think the head coaching experience will help him, uh, you know, as a, as a coordinator now too. You know, he'll kind of have an understanding and maybe he'll be able to help, you know, Mike McCarthy along the way with some of the things they're trying to do. Yeah, and look, here's one of the things that I, I think is a great way to – draw this analogy in terms of what Mike Zimmer can do for you from a culture perspective. Cause right now, Brian, you know, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. What's going to be the buzzword heading into Indy. What's going to be the thing that they, you know, in the past was, Oh, physicality. Then it was, Hey, we're doing, you know, offense. We're limiting turnovers. This is our big, uh, our, our big point. I get the sense hearing players talk after the season and talking to people behind the scenes with the Cowboys. My sense of it is they're 
big bullet point this year. I don't know if it'll be a, how much it will be publicly, but I feel like their bullet point this year is culture. And, and, and more than that, player leadership, player co- like, like player driven culture. They want more leaders in that locker room, I think. And here's the thing is that when you talk about whipping that defense into shape and, and drawing the best out of people, I, I don't know about you, but I don't know that I could come up with two polar opposite personality types as professionals to me than Deion Sanders and Darren Woodson. Like yeah. Darren Woodson is all business and and do things a certain way. Dion, greatest corner of all time, arguably, but is very me. He's very me focused and it's about prime time and everything else. Those two personalities, as wildly different as they are, both love Mike Zimmer the same yeah. way. Deion Sanders has a ton of respect for Mike Zimmer. And that's somebody who, you know, famously in a press conference, Zim was given in Minnesota. He had to stop down the media and he goes, Hold on, Dion's calling. He's been in the hospital. I haven't heard from him yet. This is the first time I've heard him. And talk to Dion on the phone. Dion, when Zim was out of football, Dion brought him over to, uh, I believe it was Jackson State his last year there and, and had him, you know, be an analyst and be around the team. So when you talk about the way Darren Woodson views things, the way Dion views things, two very different types, but two guys who both love him the same way and felt like he brought out a lot of great in them. And I think that that's encouraging to me because that to me says, Trayvon Diggs and Micah Parsons and Demarcus Lawrence and Stefan Gilmore, they can all, with their different perspectives, benefit the same way from working with this guy. No, no, no question. No question. This is a this is a hire that, you know, Mike McCarthy needs this type of hire. He really does. Mm-hmm. Now, to circle back with your buzzword, you know, with the uh culture with player player driven leadership. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I'm interested to see that because if you look at the way that McCarthy has handled, say, you know, guys being captain, it was game to game. You know, yeah, I don't like that. There wasn't permanent captains. You know, there wasn't guys that, you know, it was kind of like, you know, Christy Scales, like me and Eric would be doing the pregame show. And Christy would say, you know, <laughs> she, she would say, uh, you know, uh, T.J. Bass is captain today, <laughs> and I'm like, well, yeah, it's it's it's, it's T.J. Going, Bass, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's T.J. Yeah, it Bass, was, it's Oso yeah, Digizua it, and Noah Igbenogany. Yeah, and you're like going, okay, you know, I mean, hey, Which I, those guys, I those guys may have fine leadership. Kind of, they may, yeah, they may have fine leadership traits, but that's you, you got to identify that's, your that's guys. Thing, and it's and I don't know, I don't know if the culture, you know, we we had this discussion on the G Bag Nation today on 105.3 The Fan. We had this discussion about, you know, leadership and are leaders developed? Are they born? I, I tend to uh, tend to subscribe to that leaders are born. I really yeah. do. I and and I and I don't know if, you know, Mike McCarthy likes to talk about committees and, you know, this, that, and you know, and you're just kinda like, but who are you putting it on? You know, who are you putting these who are you putting it on, you know, the 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 you know leadership thing we talk about Dak no, nobody ever says anything negative about Dak as a leader nobody ever say, you know I've never heard anybody say anything different but who else who else on that team you know who else yeah. is that guy just you know does Zach Martin want to be a leader you know he he he's a leader by example as they like to say Tyron Smith you're lucky if you get two words from Tyron Smith but he's a you know all pro Hall of Fame player they don't have they don't have like a Chris Jones like Kansas City has, you know. Free they don't agent, have a Jason free agent, Kelsey. Free agent, like, if you want to go all in on your defensive tackle there, Brian. I'm just saying, some Chris Jones. I, I I'm, I'm not yeah, opposed. That'd be you want to play all in, sure. Chris Jones, absolutely. <laughs> I, I'd love that. Not a bad football player. No, not a bad football player. At all. But I don't know if Mike McCarthy and the way that he operates fosters leaders. I, I don't know. You know, I don't know if the, you know, if people want to believe they develop and all that. I don't know by, you know, permanent team captains, not to the playoffs, you know, but you're giving everybody an opportunity to be, you know, you're giving people opportunities to speak to the team, you know. Okay, I, but I don't, you know, there needs to be, like, you listen to people talk about the the pregame or the the before the night speech, Kansas City in the Super Bowl, you know. 
And what those guys, yeah. you know, Mahomes and Kelsey and those guys stood up and said, you know, you kind of – those are great football players. But who on this team really is that, you know – you know, CeeDee Lamb talked about it. CeeDee Lamb, you know, when he was I think, him and I Micah think CD, Parsons, you know, they talked CD, about it. I think CD can grow into that. I don't yeah. know that Micah – I don't know that Micah Parsons can. I think CD can. I, yeah. I, th- I think CD's growing and maturing, and I think CD can grow into that role because I, I think he's – I think he has a desire to, and I think that he's shown a history here in three years of whether on or off the field or just in terms of so you know locker culture and everything else. CD has a good history of identifying areas where he's deficient and fixing it, and, and he, so I, I do yeah. have I do have belief in him. He goes out and he's better every year. Yeah, every year he's gone out and gotten better. So you, as a player, as a teammate, you respect that. You know, you respect that. And sometimes, you know, there are guys that stand up there and, and, you know, go on and on and on. They're supposed to be leaders, and they're really not. Because they don't respect – the team doesn't respect that guy, you know. So, I don't know. I, I just – you know, if they're going to use the word about culture and leadership and accountability and all that, man, there, there, there might have to be some changes at some spots for that to happen. No, no doubt about it. And, and I think that may start, though, with your defensive coordinator. And that's why that's a big in terms of just He's it, a great it, hire. In my in opinion, that. I might be dead balls wrong about him. I know working with him. I know how important this is to him. So, you know, like I said, this this might be the most important hire that Mike McCarthy made because it might damn well save his job. I, I think it's I think it's a great hire. I think he's a great yeah. coach. I think that he is going to bring a lot to this football team that I'm excited about. Really quickly, before we transition over to just kind of talking some Super Bowl recap stuff and exactly how far away maybe the Cowboys are in this aspect, mm-hmm. uh, schematically, um, the, the type of X's and O's coach that you know about Zimmer, uh, your just thoughts on him. I know, like I said earlier, he is a, a big fan of double A gap pressure. He loves yeah. blitzing guys up the A gap. He, he's one of these guys who's really big into, at, at least in Minnesota, I know that this has always been the case, but I know in Minnesota he developed a bigger rep- reputation for sim pressures where yeah. it's like you're you're rushing four, but you're maybe dropping a defensive end and a linebacker's coming as that fourth pressure. Yeah. Just He, he is Fire very zone big. Is what they call it, yeah. He, he's very big into just, you know, also like he disguises his coverages. With Dan Quinn, a lot of what you saw was what you were going to get. Uh, this is different. You don't always know who's coming, who's going. You don't know who's going to drop in the coverage. It, it feels like there's a lot more schematic disguise in what Mike Zimmer wants to do than what we're used to with Dan Quinn. Well, let me say this, though, Bobby. If the Cowboys were having trouble on defense with motion, pre-snap, or at the snap, and it was causing confusion and stuff like that, that's on the players, you know? That's on the player yeah. because we saw in the Green Bay game some problems they had with that. And, you know, you could disguise stuff and all that, but if you if you bust because you're not lining up right or you're not, you know, the football intelligence or, you know, you're not learning your scheme or your, your assignments and all that, you know, I, I don't care. You could, be, you could be Steve Spagnuolo or you could be Mike Zimmer, whoever, but if your players can't take from the – from the classroom to the practice field to the games every week, I don't care who the coach is. It ain't going to work. So that's something they need to figure out. Like, you know, when Mike gets in there, he's going to have to look at it. Okay, why did you give up big plays? Why did you have problems in games? Is the communication poor? Are the checks poor? Is the scheme poorly taught? Or the players just don't know or not smart enough to, to, to do it the right way? You're going to find out very fast with Mike Zimmer how that's all going to work. You are listening to the Love the Star podcast. The Love the Star is an Odyssey podcast. You can find it on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Brian, we just got back from Las Vegas. Uh, We were out there for the Super Bowl, which saw the Chiefs win their third in five years. Uh, They beat the San Francisco 49ers 25-22. to And, uh, you know, I was struck watching this playoff run, Brian, that – I feel like Dallas is further away than I thought when I watch it in terms of not just where they're at, but where other teams are and the way other teams are going to attack them. Um, You know, we we already saw that Green Bay handled them pretty well. I think that Detroit being angry coming in here for a divisional game probably would have, you know, punched you in the mouth a little bit. 
We already saw Buffalo do it to you. San Francisco do it to it. And I feel like Baltimore and Kansas City similarly would have given them problems. So we're talking about half a dozen teams that were in the playoffs that I feel like were, were really going to be difficult for you to compete with uh, if you went up against them. But coming out of that game, watching these two go back and forth and fight in this defensive battle, I just was struck by Dallas still feels like they're a ways off. And one of the big areas that I think we're seeing this right now, you've talked before about center play. Yeah. how the center play's got to get better, and that's something that really stands out from some of these teams. Uh, we, the, the San Francisco center, I'm, I'm forgetting his name right now, uh, Brendel or, or, or whatever his name is, Plano East alum right here. I'm wearing the Plano mm-hmm. East high uh, hat there, so shout out to him, a local guy. But center play had been important for the final four teams. We also talked about linebackers, and I think you saw in this game when Drake Greenlaw went out, and they were forced to go to some of these reserve defenders. Oren Burks playing linebacker yeah. just got torched for them. Yeah, And when you hear Jordan Love talk to Micah Parsons this week, Brian, he said, essentially, we knew we could attack your linebackers. Right. We knew we could do whatever we wanted there. Is the biggest obstacle to this team becoming on that level to where they can compete right now? Do you think the biggest obstacle right now there potentially in terms of their personnel is their linebacker group? I would address the center first, as you mentioned. I mean, I, to me, that's You've got to figure out how to run the football better. You just do. And, you know, Biotish, there were some games, you always hear me say this, there were some games where he was good enough, and other times he wasn't. You know, they just did not have that ability to get after the defense in the running game like they needed to. They weren't winning near enough in the middle. You know, and you, you kind of think about, well, there's Zach Martin and, you know, Zach Martin and Terrence Steele, they, they had their struggles too. Sure. You know, it just wasn't the tight ends, point of attack blocking. You draft Schoonmaker. You know, you're kind of feeling like that he's going to be a guy that's going to help you right off the jump. You know, they struggled in that area. You know, they, they've got to. But to me, if you want to get back to being a, a better team running the football, you got to address that center position. You have to find somebody – that's that can that can not only get a little movement when you need to, but also reach wide techniques. You know, get to the second level, cut guys off, give backs the opportunity to you know cut behind them. So, yeah, that and you mentioned the linebacker. You know, Zim is, I guarantee you, has already watched the Dallas film a bunch, yeah. and he's seen what Dan Quinn tried to do. He he just. You know, Dan, I think Dan got caught in a situation. The big, one of the bigger mistakes they made this year was the fact that they went light at linebacker. That they just said, okay, we're going to play so much nickel and dime with these linebackers and we'll be fine. And then all of a sudden, you lose Overshone, who looked like he had a huge amount of promise. You lose, uh, you know, Leighton Vander Esch. And now you're down to, and you didn't get the jump the second year jump that you thought you were going to get from Clark. Right. You know? And it was a problem. That was a problem. So, yeah. And I look at this draft, Bobby, and I know you're 60 some odd guys in it as well. I don't know how many linebackers you looked at. It's a good group. The best linebacker, I think, is a kid named Wilson at uh, North Carolina State. Mm-hmm. But his situation is, you know, He's so beat up, you know, we're yeah. talking multiple surgeries, you know, and how many of these guys have we seen the Cowboys draft and it's, they have a three to five year career and that's it. It's over, you know? Yeah. You know, Bruce Carter, <laughs> you know, Jalen Smith, uh, Sean Lee, Sean Lee, Leighton Van Der Esch. It just goes on and on and on, you know? Let and me let me let me let me let me propose a scenario to you. I'm going to give you a fake two round mock draft, and then we'll see throughout the process how realistic these things sort of become. Guys can rise, guys can fall, things can change. This may not be tenable at all. How much better do you feel about this team next year? You handle whatever you can handle in free agency, whatever else. But how much better do you feel about this team next year if your first pick is Jackson Powers Johnson at Oregon? as a center, and then your linebacker in the second round is Edge Cooper from Texas A&M. Yeah, I feel fine. Do you feel better about this team feel better. knowing, hey, those are yeah. your first two picks? feel better. I just wish Wilson was healthy, you know, <laughs> from North yeah. Carolina State. Yeah. I wish he was healthy. 
if he was healthy, he would probably be gone long, you know, way before, you know. Eichenberg from Ohio State's another one. My guy, you know, my guy Jeremiah Trotter Jr. is a shorter guy, you know. Love to have him. You know, I wish he was as big as his dad. He's not. But, you know, mm-hmm. he's got the same kind of temperament, you know, and wanting to get around the football. But, Bobby, this is where I'm going to probably throw a curveball at you right here. Because this is where, to me, that maybe Dallas, they say, you know what, we're going to actually go out and get somebody. And we'll go out and get a linebacker. You know, Not opposed. I could see the, the Jerry Jones pushing chips in the middle you know, comment. I could see that being we went out and we signed a linebacker. To, and, 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 it, and it shouldn't keep them from drafting a linebacker either. But they only have so many picks right now. You know? So, no, in fact, let me let me let me run some. I, I had recently run this by some people. Let's just talk about freeing up some money. So, the discussion recently, Brian, has been that Dak Prescott. The the word is it sounds like they're going to try and get something done. That's the reports that you know uh, people are starting to to chatter about. That they could let it ride, but let's just assume right now they're about twenty million dollars over the cap. Let's assume they knock out Dak's extension. That frees up probably twenty five million. That puts them five million in the black. If you want to free up another forty million, here's what you can do. And I don't think these are the. I don't think you would be opposed to these, Brian. I, I wouldn't assume so. Get an extension done with Ceedee Lamb. That gets you ten million dollars off the cap just by signing him to an extension. That seems like a no brainer right now. No brainer. Uh, you go ahead and restructure Diggs and Steel, which their contracts were built to be restructured. They put right. those little switches in there. That's twelve point eight million right there. You release Leighton Vander Esch and Cooper Rush. That gives you another four million. Do they want to release Cooper Rush? Maybe not, but I mean they do have Trey Lance here. They got to figure that out. By the yeah, way, they, they got they a fifth. Just play, you know, Trey Lance is your backup. They got That's a fifth me. year. They they got a fifth year option question about Lance that they're going to have to answer yes. here soon, which I doubt they pick up. But uh, a post June one release on Michael Gallup. That would be nine and a half million, and then a uh, a restructure on Brandon Cooks is four and a half. If you do all that and get Dak, you end up about forty-five million dollars in cap space, and that's plenty to go play around in the free agent pool if you want. No, I don't disagree. I mean, I I love everything you said. I, I do feel like though they are going to look at they're going to look at the linebacker situation. They're going to look at the linebackers that are on the market, and they're going to try and figure out which one of these guys they want. And I, I think that's that, I think that everything you said I think is absolutely right, and the move that they're going to make is to go get one of these linebackers. That's just my prediction. That's just my gut feeling. They're gonna because you look at the college linebackers and there's some good linebackers, but there's some lack of height. There's some you know injury history. You know there's some things that you know aren't totally inviting. You know the A and M kid's a good player. He really really is. He's got good length, long. You know he's a tall guy. Plays well, you know, gets off box. All those things you like in a linebacker. Does very, very well around the ball. Causes turnovers. Picks up turnovers. You know, those, I mean, the two names you gave me are absolutely spot on. You know, I'd be super happy. But uh, I think that the, I think they're going to have to go get a veteran guy too. I just don't think that they can sit there and say, okay, we're going to play with Clark, Overshone, and then a, a rookie guy now. I just don't see them doing that. What if I tell you you can get Clark Overshone, sign Patrick Queen, and then your first two picks in the draft, you just throw out the offensive line and you say, we're going to get Jackson, we're going to get Powers Johnson, and then we're going to get in the second round, we're going to hope Kingsley Suamataia falls to us from BYU. Yeah. You feel better about that collection? You you feel better about that offseason? Yeah. I feel, you know, the BYU kid is, is interesting. Um, I think Sua Mata better, better has got when they rush through him. High ceil- they- I, th- I think that's a high ceiling player right there. Do you really? I think I think he could be really, really good. I, I think there's some stuff about him that obviously you you need to to work on. And you need to correct. I think it's I think it's really fixable stuff. I think he's got natural instincts. I think that I think it's the same sort of stuff that you view as correctable when you identify somebody like Tyler Smith or you identify somebody like Colton Miller. And you say, yeah, there's some bad flaws See, I wasn't here, a but huge I, I think you Miller fan, and I, and I was wrong about him. You know? That's the thing. You just you got to know the player. Like, like I'm not talking about you. You got to know the type of 
worker that guy is. Like the Cowboys scouts will know. Is this somebody who we feel like can work and reach the potential and iron these things out? But I think just a, a film view would say, hey, these are correctable things if you believe in the work ethic of the player. Right. And so I, I think the the ability, the athleticism, the size, everything else, I think it's so rare. And, and I think that the instincts are really good. And and he's got a Mauler's mentality. He really does. Uh, you just you got to hope that he irons out some of that stuff. You down with that, Brian? I'm okay down with that. that. I mean, I just, <laughs> like I said, I was just, <laughs> you know. You're, I know I love, you're, Su- I know I love Suamata Ia more than you do. I, I'm, yeah, I'm a you big do. fan of it. You do. You do. But, I mean, and, and, you know, I, and I, you know, I don't think there's anything that I would, you know, really, really disagree. I just think that to me, there's other tackles that I would, you know, I would go through and I'm pulling up my notes here right now of guys that, you know, I could think about that I would like to have, you know, just because. Guyton, Latham. Yeah, I mean, Guyton to me is, I mean, that's a, there's some massive dudes in this, in this draft class. Waga, you know, there's Mims. some guys that have got some, they've got some size to them. Uh, and you watch them and they're, and they're really, they're very, very good athletes too, you know, but I, I just, like I said, I, there's, I, I would, I would be very kind of cautious you know, with the BYU kid, I just don't. I don't see that, it. That's, that's going to be like our fight. Do. That's that's going to be our fight this spring. We're, oh, we're no, going to that, okay. that, that that'll I mean, be our guy to hey, fight. It's over, good. Okay? It's good. To, I mean, <laughs> but like I said, I feel like though to me, when people rush him down the middle, mm-hmm. he's he's fine. He's fine. But you watch when people get out on the edge on him. Sometimes that's where he things kind of fall apart for him a little bit. But yeah. you seem to feel like that he's got that it factor. Am I right about that? Yeah, yeah. No, I just think that, like, I love the mentality. Like, I feel like a lot of times when he misses, it's, like, over-aggressiveness. He's too eager. He's trying to just bury people. I feel like it's technique stuff. He's still very, very young. And I think athletically... And that's rare for a BYU guy to be young. Too. Yeah, I know. Usually, they're, they're, They've usually come back from a couple of mission trips, and they're about yeah, 35. They're 27 uh, years old playing tackle for you. But yeah. th- this is a young guy with rare athleticism in a big frame, a big body. Yeah. No, that you're, it just, you know, me, you're, you're not wrong about the guy. I, I, I think... Not, I think I, I, not that the players are the same, but I think when you talk about, oh, raw, young, Big, athletic, like it sounds very similar to Tyler Smith. So if you believe in the work ethic the same way you believed in Tyler Smith, I think that you can foster that. I don't think they're the same player by any means, but I I think that you can foster it in a way that you did with Tyler Smith. And you just say, we're going to bank on the traits and the work ethic and the potential that this kid has. And so I'm a fan. I like him. No, I, I, hey, that's what I'm saying. That's the great thing about this time of year is that. You know, everybody sees these players a little bit different, you know, and you got to be careful with that herd mentality. You know, if you, hey, if you like a guy, sure. great. You know, if you don't, you know, you got to stand up for what you are. And that, there'll probably be six, seven people that like a player better than you. And you're just like, okay, well, you know, hey, you do this long enough, you'll be wrong <laughs> about some guys. You'll absolutely oh. be. But it is a good group of tackles. You know, if oh, you yeah, there's, there's, there's needs a, an offensive tackle, I'm totally on board with what's going on. Here. If you need a receiver, if you need some offensive linemen, this is a good draft for you. You got some, you got some guys right. that you can pick from here. All right. right, you are listening to the Love the Star podcast, the Love the Stars and Odyssey podcast. You can find it on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Brian, it is now time for our Dean Julia Love the Star mailbag. Our dear sweet listeners have some questions that they want to throw out to us today. Uh, the first one here from, uh, let's go with Sam Hooper. He says, is Osa signing an extension this offseason slash summer? Feels like he could be a sneaky one to get done during training camp. I really like Oso Digizua. Here's the thing that the Cowboys are going to have to figure out with Osa. Um, the, the burnout factor has been very real for him the first yes. couple of years. He, yes. he just tends to burn out around December. Um, yes. I think that he's been really consistent for the most part. I think the effort is always there. He's 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 not a a loafer. He doesn't take plays off. Nope. But I think he I think he tends to just get worn down a little bit by the end of the year. That that motor it's always running so hot that, you know, you 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 burn the candle at both ends a little bit. But that's a player that for the right price for the market value, Brian, that that would be a player that you would like to see remain here, right? That that's a guy that you're a fan of. Yeah, I, I, th- I think you're. I think you're dead on right about the kid. I mean, the the problem is that why is, why does he play really really well till you know week twelve, week thirteen, and then after that it's just a it's a struggle. So they have to figure out things about him. I mean, you know, he's a guy that's really in tune to his body. Um, 
he's he you know he he's plays with some explosiveness. He's got a little power. He's slippery in the way he plays. But he, they clearly his game declines, as you mentioned, when we get to December. Yeah, it, it, and it tends to happen. That happens a lot, too, with young players in general. I mean, Micah has been accused of having that happen as well. I, I think young players just tend to, they, 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 they've got to learn to pace themselves a little bit or, or just get their conditioning to the point where they, they can hold up over a full season. you got to remember a lot of these guys, and I'm not saying this to you, but just in general, a lot of these guys are used to playing 13-game seasons leading up to their no NFL question. careers, and then yeah. they head into, you know, it's around game 13 where they start burning out a little bit. Right. Uh, next question here from Brandon. He's asking, what has Zimmer done personnel-wise in the past that gives you an idea of some of the defensive free agents, draft prospects we should keep an eye on, front seven and safeties? Without specific names, here's what I do want to ask you, Brian. Uh, along that question, to just kind of interpret it, I guess, from Brandon. In your experience as somebody who is in there helping to build personnel and working alongside Mike Zimmer, we always hear about, oh, uh, the Seattle people, they like long corners, people like this, that. Are there any sort of rules that you remember Mike Zimmer having about, hey, my guys need to be this. My corners need to be this. My defensive ends, I want this. Were there traits yeah, that were long, like non-negotiables for him? Yeah, long corners. You got to be able to play you got to be able to play press, man. If you're going to play for Mike Zimmer, you got to be able to play press. You got to be able to get up on guys. You got to be able to jam them. You got to be able to run with them. You know, you got to be physical. Um, you know, he looks for those those techniques, those inside the ones and the threes. Got to be upfield players. You know, linebackers, um, downhill players, really good tacklers. Safeties, he's always been around safeties. I mean, you look at Harrison Smith and guys like that he's played with. He's been with Darren Woodson. You, know, you have to be smart. You have to be tough. Uh, but, yeah, he, he is, his whole mentality is about a tough defense. So he needs that from, he needs that from his, his one and his three. He needs those linebackers to play downhill. And he needs corners that play on the press, and he needs smart safeties. That that's kind of what Mike Zimmer is. Now, it, because we know the history with Dexter Coakley, Datwin, guys like that, is he not as much of a stickler then for the big linebacker? Like, would he look at a guy like Marquis Spell and say, "Okay, I can work with Marquis Spell"? Yeah, I mean, I don't know to that extent. Um, he's played with shorter linebackers before, and mm-hmm. had success. Um, but I think ideally he'd want to get a little bit bigger. Maybe it's a little bit different era now with uh, with the size of these linebackers. I don't know if he would play Bell as that type of guy. I don't know if that would be a guy that he goes, okay, I'm going to put him out there down after down after down. I think I think Bell would appreciate it to move back to safety if he could. You know, sure. I think he I think he would like you know you know find some other roles for him other than having to deal with you know, blockers in his face all day. Uh, our, our buddy, John owning uh, from pro football focus, a uh, good friend, good listener here. Yeah, uh, he's guy. asking uh, any thoughts on uh, who might be on Zimmer's defensive staff, Brian? No, I mean, um, I talked to Mike and I mentioned it earlier. Um, I asked him, I said, Hey, are you going to be able to bring anybody? And he said, listen, he goes right now, I just need to meet with the staff and see what I got. You know, um, there's been guys around the league that he's worked with, uh, that you know, guys in Cincinnati, um, that that I you know, I think he might look at if he can. He his uh, Andre Patterson was a guy, a defensive line coach here. I think Andre's with the Giants now, and I think he's still under contract and all that. So I don't know. Mike is like I say, he's going to have to come here and kind of figure some things out. And then go from there first. That's you know, I, I you know I asked him that you know, exact question, and he he said no. Nah, he just he won't know until he gets here and starts visiting with guys. I, I would point out uh, one thing. Uh, Paul and Gunther I, was that a guy? Yeah, yeah, that, that was a guy in Cincinnati, Cincinnati that I think he worked yeah. with. Yeah. Uh, now, now I will point out this because you know people are talking about the defensive lines, but I don't know that this is who it would elevate. It's just a connection. A lot of people don't realize Sharif Floyd, Sharif Floyd was here, yeah, was here exactly. last year. As an, he was an assistant defensive line coach, and he played for Mike Zimmer in Minnesota. He played Mike, yeah, exactly, years. yeah. And so that may be somebody that Zimmer says, "Hey, I think he can handle this. Let's yeah, just elevate him." Yeah, Let's that's talk. why he has to come meet with the staff, right? That that's that's the goal. Now, I did see some people asking. I know we got the question from a couple of different people. Does Mike Zimmer returning mean a return for George Edwards? Here's what I would say. I don't think. <laughs> Not, not, not to, 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 and you don't have to speak on this. I will just speak for myself, Brian, if you don't want to. I don't think there's any chance in hell Mike McCarthy would let that happen, nope. personally. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think he's letting George Edwards come back. And that's nothing against George Edwards. 
I think that's more about just two different personalities. And, yep. I, and I think that that's what's the factor there. Totally agree. Uh, uh, let's uh, wrap up with this question here for you, Brian. Uh, this is from Brian Cheryl. If Stefan Gilmore really wants to be here, you guys interviewed him. Great interview with him and Brandon Cooks last week uh, at Radio Row with you guys from G-Bag Nation. Gave some really great answers. I think showed high character, veteran leadership there. Uh, but if Gilmore wants to be here and is affordable, would he be a good option for next year with Diggs coming off of injury? If he does return, where does Bland move to? W- would you think that Gilmore returning would be a a good thing? Or do you think the Cowboys say, eh, he kind of lost a step. Let's go ahead and just, you know, see what else we can find. He's lost a step. That's true. But he's also a guy that through that interview, you kind of get an understanding that football is important to him, you know, and he'd mm-hmm. like to come back. I think that you could tell people, Bobby, I, I bet you have better intelligence on this than me, that that they like him. They like him as a possibility of coming back, mm-hmm. but it has to be at the right price. And I'm not talking about, you know, that, you know, veteran minimum or something like that. I think they, yeah, you know, it just has reasonable. to fit what they want to do. And we'll see if it fits what he wants to do. But I think there's some some mutual interest between the two. The money's going to be the factor here on this one. Yeah, Gilmore grew up a Cowboys fan. Gilmore was actually came out in the draft where they took Morris Claiborne. And mm-hmm. I know talking to some people that he had had discussions with his team the night before the draft, and he was like, man, could you imagine if Dallas came up? I could be in position for Dallas. What if Dallas took me? He, he always wanted to be here. This was his childhood team. He loved them. And I think last year people really valued his leadership in that locker room. And you saw that leadership on display in the interview that he gave. Yeah. Uh, but I think you're right. I, I think the, the dollar amount's going to have to matter. It's just going to have to work for both sides. Um, and, and I think that Dallas, though, not for a veteran minimum, like you say, uh, they, they'd be willing to spend some money to have him return. But but yeah. it's got to be the right value to them. It's got to be and the right he, value, for sure. If he does return, uh, Bland in the slot, you think, next year? Yes. I, and but I, you got to you – I mean, there's, there's some really good corners in this draft, too. Sure. You know, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's several of them that, you know, I would absolutely – you know, Boy, we're, if you're we're talking we're, about guys that that you know Zimmer, you know, you're talking about guys that could play, you know, the man coverage. You know, I think that's that's something that that we, you know, is I, I know the uh, Quinion uh, Mitchell, the Mitchell. kid from Toledo. I mm-hmm. mean, you know, guys, you know, plays both sides. I mean, he's intercepts. He's always around the ball. He's He's got long features, but you know he he's he's got some he's got that ability to play up on you, and kind of harass you that way. I, you know, there's uh, you know the the, Al- the two Alabama corners I think are really really good. Um, yeah, I saw a kid. I saw this kid, uh, T.J. Tampa from Iowa State. When you I've start to talk to him, he's six two. He's two hundred pounds. The movement, the balance, I mean, the read, you know, he playing the route, the hands, he gets on the ball, he could track the ball. I mean, there's there's very much some guys in this draft that you would you would absolutely as you know, as a cowboy fans, you you should pay attention to. Uh, you know, Kwame Lassiter from uh uh not Kwame, uh Kumari. Kamari. Kwame Kwame, Kwame was on your from, football uh, teams. From Georgia, <laughs> you know. I mean, there's another guy, both sides of the defense, fluid athlete. Yeah. He matches up well with men, you know, his man. I mean, there's Scanny. There's a lot of good corners in this draft. There really are. Now, now you mentioned uh, just my own question here because we haven't had a chance to talk about this yet. The two Alabama corners, uh, Terry and Arnold and Kool-Aid McKinstry. Who are you right. a bigger fan of? Arnold. I think yeah. All right, me, we agree on that. We we, yeah. we could we we agree on that one. So we, we, we don't have to talk one. about we don't have to talk yeah. about Suamata Ia. We agree that Arnold's better. There we go. Yeah, I think that Arnold, he usually plays on the left side of the defense, and he can play in the slot as well. He's confident. He's physical. He can mix it up. I respect the way this kid plays because of the physical side of the game. He's not going to shy away from contact. He's going to wrap up in the open field. He throws his body around. You know, he plays well in coverage. He's got quick feet. He can stay in balance. He's in position. He says best when he can play press. I mean, that's, that's you know, six foot, 196 pounds. That's the kind of guy that, uh, that, that Mike Zimmer is looking for, that guy that can play really good press coverage and then carry guys, track the ball, and make plays on the ball. 
That does it for us here today on the Love of the Star podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back with another episode this week. Uh, and we are full on in draft season and free agency mode and everything else. Uh, a lot of exciting things around the corner. Uh, thank you guys so much for hanging around with us. And also, thank you so much for just contributing to our Odyssey podcast network and, and everything that we do there. We got some exciting news earlier today, I know, uh, uh, before we recorded this show. Uh, Triton, uh, the digital streaming company, named Odyssey the number one sports podcasting platform uh, in the country by their metrics. And so uh, you guys helped contribute to that. And so we are very grateful for you and everything that you do and, and help us out. And so uh, we're excited for another great off season of debate and heartache and everything else leading into uh, our, our, our eternal wrong. suffering again next year. Because this is what we do. We have a sickness here. Uh, For Brian Broaddus, I'm Bobby Bell. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. If you want to see more of our videos, be sure to check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date on our latest updates. Links are in the description. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.